Blog Talk Radio. Unplugged. We have a very special show today with two awesome, terrific guests joining us. It's going to be very exciting. I am Jacob Noble from the ProBasketballTalk.com. In a moment, we'll have Brian Geltzel and my co-host from the Hoops Critic, or I should say Hoops Critic. You can follow him at Hoops Critic. And we're going to talk some uh, some basketball today. We're going to have a little fun with our first guest, so, you know, get a little comedy, get some laughter. Then our second guest is uh, Zach Hopper from True Hoop ESPN. He'll be in to break down uh, the playoffs with us as we're finding out the matchup. So we'll actually have a little more concrete um, matchups to discuss, and we'll uh, pick our favorites, and we'll go on from there. How are we doing today, Brian? I'm doing well. How are you? Pretty good, pretty good. You know, it's just get some nice weather. That little storm passed the Northeast, and uh, we're ready to roll. You know, some teams know who they're playing first round, and it's going to get very exciting. Uh, it certainly is. You know, as each day rolls by here, as we get through the week, we uh, we one more matchup solidifies itself. So last night, San Antonio's win locks us in on San Antonio being in the one seed. We know Oak City is going to be in the two. So uh, tonight we'll get a little bit of a clearer picture when Phoenix plays Utah, who their uh, their uh, San Antonio's opponent is going to be. So as time goes on here at all, the picture starts to come together a little bit. And then once the tournament starts, that's when the real fun begins. Because I'll tell you, Jacob, one thing I will say is that I am very grateful, and I tweeted this last night, that we now get to go five years without one of these crappy compressed seasons. Because the quality of play in the NBA in the month of April, the amount of players injured, the amount of teams sitting guys, for good reason, because why are you going to get guys hurt in a season where you want to tank and you're not going anywhere? And why are you going to get guys hurt when you need healthy players for the playoffs? So it, it, it makes sense why they would sit these guys, but it's just created a garbage product on the court. It really has. It's, and, you know, it, what, what's interesting, Brian, is you, you would think with the compressed schedule that it would actually be the opposite, that these last few games wouldn't matter. And we're kind of seeing it matter out west. And, you know, you've got a few teams that are fighting for that last playoff spot, um, although, you know, the time is winding down out there. But you would think that, you know, for the most part, with less games, it would be less room for error, whereas, you know, in our regular 82-game season, we're used to seeing this, uh, you know, quote-unquote tank ball or rest of the playoff ball coming down the stretch. Yeah, you certainly are, but but normally, again, it's just when the games are spaced out in a healthier fashion. You know, I mean, you look at the season normally being uh, over a six-month period, so 180 games, so you get 82 games in, let's say, 185, 190 days, so the teams are playing once every two and a half to three days, once every two and a half days. Now you have teams playing less than once every two days. And the travel is just brutal alone, but it's really the cumulative effect in it has been has been awful on the quality of play. And you see a lot of teams that are just trying to survive the season and get through. I mean, the Heat had a press release this morning. Every single player on their roster is a game time decision tonight. They're not guaranteeing anybody plays. And, and but I can't blame Eric Spolster. It's what you have to do right now to make sure that your team's healthy, and you don't want to put even a guy with a little, a slightest nick out there on the court. If you don't get the one seed, who cares? You need a healthy team to start the playoffs. Um, the 66 games in 123 days, Jacob, was probably one of the worst ideas I have ever seen David Stern have. Um, it was a, it was a money grab from the very beginning, and it is really it's it's done a job on the league this year. And, and it's interesting to see what kind of hangover there's going to be into the playoffs based upon this nutty, uh, you know, long term sprint of a season. Yeah, I mean, most people agree with you there, Brian, that, you know, it probably should have just been a 50-game season with the amount of time that they had. But, you know, 
I don't have the numbers in front of me. I know you don't have them either. But to see that extra 16 games for each team, I'm sure the revenue was just, you know, was the main factor. And it always is the main factor. So you can kind of see why they decided to squeeze in as many games as they could for the revenue factor. But you're absolutely right. It, it, it put a hamper on the product on the field. But, you know, luckily next year we won't have to deal with this, as you point out. We'll have, a you know, an actual training camp. We'll have practices throughout the week. Um, you're going to see teams just playing better basketball because right now it's kind of ugly with, uh, you know, mostly bench players playing these days. And it's funny, you know, I was waiting to hear back if I'm going to get credential for tonight's game. But, you know, I might pass it down. Why do I want to go see Norris Cole face Avery Bradley as the marquee matchup for tonight's Celtics and Heat's game? You probably don't. You know what I mean? You probably don't. It's, 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 this is like what's happened here at the end of the season is a lot of these games have become akin to preseason games. Teams are treating this last week of the season, you know, when, granted, the ones that are trying to get in the playoffs, you know, Phoenix and Utah tonight at 1030 are, are going to, you know, go balls out and, and play play their game um, and do the best they can. But, like, San Antonio's been treating it like the preseason. And they've gotten a number one seed treating it like the preseason here for the last two weeks because they want their season starts Saturday when the playoffs start. And, and that's the way they're looking at it. And I don't blame them. And a lot of these teams that have been out of it, I mean, they've been rolling players out who are absolutely terrible. Look at what Golden State's put on the court night in and night out. It's disgusting. You know, and they want to tell you, well, you know, we, we're going we're gonna to rest Steph Curry's really hurt. I'm not sure how hurt he is. I'm not sure how hurt David Lee is. I just think they don't want these guys to risk having a chronic type of injury um, when they're in a situation where they're going nowhere this year. So let's make sure that we have these guys rested and make a playoff push for next year. Makes sense, but it's not exactly fair to the fan. Yeah, and, you know, Steve Collar was on with us last week at this time, and, and he brought up a fantastic points about all this. And, you know, we talked a little bit about Tankapalooza and everything like that. But, you know, the teams are trying to find out what they can find out in, in you know, in the D League and, and the undrafted players. And San Antonio is a perfect example. They find a lot, a lot of good, you know, players that a lot of teams miss. But having said all that, we have our first guest today. We have Taz Malaz from The Basketball Jones, which is a fantastic website. They've been going for many, many years. It's almost a decade, if you can believe it. I know they have their sixth annual award show the other night. Um, they posted on their site, which is a fantastic read. You can follow him on Twitter. It's T A S M E L. A.S., and how are you doing today, Taz? I'm doing well, guys. It's almost a decade. I can't believe it because it's, it's not quite a decade. I mean, we can't, we can't take that much credit. Six years in, but uh, pretty decent, pretty decent amount, yeah. Considering well, the Internet age. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Taz, i got to tell you, I enjoy it. It's very entertaining. It's a lot of fun. You know, one of the things I look at with the NBA is, is you know, it's not, it's not medical science. You know, it's not education. It's basketball. It's fun. And I love what you guys do there. You make it a real good time. Um, you, you make, you position the NBA in such a fun fashion that, that it's, it's very entertaining for the fans. And, and, and for that, I, I, I thank you, and I certainly enjoy it. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, um, I mean, we take it a little too seriously at times as well, but uh, definitely you keep it lighthearted as well. I mean, well, you know, this is, it's exactly that. I say the same thing when I try and explain it to people that a lot of commentators slash media uh, you know, sites slash uh, television stations slash websites just uh, take it a little, a little too seriously, and that's, uh, that's where we thrive, I think. And, you know, having um, uh, established friendships with the guys I work with uh, for years beforehand – um, you know, allowed us to take what we did uh, in our previous lives uh, of just, you know, just shooting the, sh the shit, basically, and, and continuing it that way. Um, so it, it, it didn't really change that much, and, and we prided ourselves on, you know, because we were, uh, again, friends and, and, and just an independent website, you know, we we wanted to, to thrive that way, and we wanted to keep it fresh and unique, and, and uh, so that's that's where, we're, where we've come from, and I appreciate the compliment. You do have a lot of the uh, most bizarre and interesting topics of the NBA that most other outlets won't touch, and we thank you for that. And having said that, um, your boy Hidu Turkoglu is in the news today talking about he's hoping to get ready for the playoffs. So i got two questions for you about Hidu, and one is what Hidu jersey are you currently wearing, and two, what are your expectations for the Magic this, this postseason without Dwight? <laughs> uh, so was the first question, what jersey am I currently wearing? Yes, which Hedo jersey? Because I know you only wear Hedo jerseys. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Well, I've got a nice. Uh, <laughs> I've got I've got the road blacks that match with my uh, my Vince Carter and one Thai cheese. Uh, <laughs> so, 
so I never take that one off. It's it's quite comfortable. It's uh, it's 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 the synthetic one, but it's it's still comfortable enough that it's not uh, you know that cheap feel where you need to wear band aids on your nipples. It's it's nice and soft. <laughs> um, so I go with that one. And as for expectations, uh, I think I think the Magic could run me out there and, and do as well as they're probably going to do. I, I it's hard to have faith in this team. And last year. Uh, I picked them against the Hawks, and my co-host Skeets picked uh, picked the Hawks against them, and I was I was shocked to see you know the the Hawks uh, the Hawks that we all ridicule have way more fight than the Orlando Magic. So uh, you know them being knocked off of the Hawks gives me absolutely no confidence in them whatsoever. You know without that Dwight, of course. Uh, you know they might play hard for a couple games, but I'm not a uh, you know I'm, I'm I'm falling off the Jameer Nelson bandwagon. I used to love the guy. Uh, you know, when he became that all-star in 2009, and unfortunately I don't think he's got that same drive and passion that the other great point guards have in this league. So I don't, I don't think there's a chance for them. If they win two games, I mean, no matter who they play, I'll be surprised. You know, Todd, just for the record, by the way, I do wear Band-Aids on my nipples all the time, and that's just to keep random people from coming up to me and trying to milk me. Um, but, <laughs> all right, but, but with that said, all right, um, Let's talk about Dwight for a minute. We kind of uh, Jacob just kind of went there. Um, I have been of the opinion um, since Dwight decided not to sign the opt out, so essentially opt in for the last year, that the only reason he did that was to be able to p- play in the playoffs this year. So, needless to say, Stephen A. Smith's report from earlier in the week that a trade demand is forthcoming from Dwight to me wasn't really news. I've expected it. I believe it's going to happen. A couple of people I've spoken to have told me that that's in the offing. Um, talk to me a little bit about Stan and Dwight, Dwight, the state of the Magic after Dwight, and and what you think Dwight's future is going to be, and and how this whole Magic mess plays out going forward. Well, the fact that, you know, he declared for a trade the first few months and then decided to opt in for the next year, to me, nothing has changed. Nothing has been optimized in that situation for him. So I, I thought when he said, you know, I'm coming back for this following year, I thought he just was saying that something isn't going right for me this off season that I knew previously or that I thought previously would happen. So I'm going to stick around here and probably leave next year. That's just how I thought it, of it. You know, it a, he just got a guaranteed year. There maybe is a possibility that he found out that he couldn't go to Dallas along with Darren Williams. Cuban uh, maybe informed him, not saying that there's any sort of uh, conspiracy theory or tampering going on, but the fact is these guys talk behind the scenes. But what made him stay for another year? I don't think anything changed. The fact that his management team maybe told him that Stan Van would be fired this off season. Well, if I'm Dwight Howard, do I want to go forward with Dwight, or I'm sorry, Hito Turgaloo and Jameer Nelson and, and co next year? All those guys are locked in. The roster is not changing whatsoever next season. Uh, you know, they're, they're above the salary cap as it is for 2012, 2013. So I think, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, you know, Stephen A. Smith is, is probably onto something there. Uh, he's he's going to want out eventually, and if it's not by the summer, he's going to throw his whole team under the bus and he's going to do this whole thing again and eventually they're going to get rid of him by the trade deadline because I just don't think he's happy and I don't see the point uh, in him being there how can he possibly go forward with the mess that he's created there for a guy that loves to be liked he loves you know a a good quote-unquote PR image Uh, I I think he's really screwed that up so he's not going to feel comfortable there because of you know I don't want to get psychological here but he's He needs to be liked, and he's not going to be liked in that situation. So eventually he definitely is going to want to be out. He's staying away from the team during the playoffs. He's hanging out in L.A. rehabilitating. shouldn't say hanging out, but he's not going to be anywhere near the team. You know, the report came out today um, through the Orlando writers. So uh, I don't think he's happy with the team whatsoever. I think he is going to be gone uh, sooner rather than later. If he's in training camp, I'd be really surprised. Yeah, uh, Taj, you you hit a lot of good points there, and I think that, you know, the one person who's sitting back and enjoying all this more than anybody is LeBron because all the ridicule he got for the way he handled it, and you know what, maybe he handled it the correct way after seeing all this and seeing the way, you know, Melo ran ran himself out of Denver and the way Dwight's trying to run himself out of Orlando, you know, it's almost like a Band-Aid, just rip it off real fast and, you know, worry about the short-term pain instead of, you know, slowly peeling out that Band-Aid all season long, and that's basically what he's doing, but uh, talking about PR and reputation, I'm going to shift this to the 
the elbow hurt around the world, and that is the Ron Artest elbow to James Harden. Talk to us a little bit about your opinions on that. And, uh, you know, there's people on both sides of the fence, more so on the side that it was intentional, dirty, and he should be thrown in jail for that. Um, talk to us a little bit about your opinions on the elbow. Uh, just to go back quickly to that question, I think you sort of mentioned, uh, you know, about Dwight and, uh, and the LeBron scenario. I think Darren Williams is the guy who played it right so far this season. I, I think, you know, he hasn't said a thing. He may have been in on some of the consultations about Nets moves this year, but that's one guy that is going to get out of there this year. He's got a player option for next year. No one is even talking about whether or not he's going to take it, pick it up or not. I'm 99.9% sure he's out of there. He hated playing it in Newark, and I know they're moving to Brooklyn next season, but uh, just his body language all year long, um, the fact that he didn't play up to his potential for a good chunk of the year, uh, it makes me feel like he's out of there. So I think he played it right. As for uh, big Ron Ron, uh, the fact is, uh, you know, I think he just, lost his brain there for a second and and I think he's made great strides and I saw a great post on Silver Screen and Roll about this that he's made great strides the last few years and in trying to alleviate uh, get himself away from all those problems that he had because of of childhood and the psychological problems he's been a a, a, a big backer of uh, psychologists and and, and his his psychiatrist uh, and and that's been great to see and he just had a little lapse there and that's as simple as that to me I mean it was a, you know, it was a celebration, and it was part of the get off me, uh, you know, type thing that when guys get in each other's space, that's what it was. But he just, he just doesn't know the ramifications of his actions at times, and, and uh, I think he, these, these lapses are fewer and far between now with Ron, and that's commendable for him because he's come a long way. But at the same time, I mean, he, the book has to be thrown at him because, it, like as you guys mentioned, this is a PR league, and to see. James Harden's beard slash brain rattling all over, uh, you know, in, in in video for weeks on end. That's that's all we're gonna see here, as as a casual fan will see. And David Stern can't, and Stu Jackson can't stand for that. So by throwing a book at him, I think it means only ten games or so, uh, because elbows usually get you know a game or two or three at the max. So I think ten is. In, in technically speaking, uh, throwing the book at him. So uh, I think that's what he gets, and I think that's what he deserves. But at the same time, uh, Ron, I think just his brain just shut off there for a second, and you saw him when, when Serge Ibaka approached him later. He kind of had that street ball look in his eye. You know, he grabbed his shorts, kind of grabbed his crotch, and said, let's go. And, uh, you know, you just – again, they are fewer and far between. This wasn't Malice of the Palace by any means, but uh, he's got to get 10, I'd say. Yeah, I'm actually with you. I think, listen, I think if it was anybody else that threw an elbow in that fashion, it'd be five. Because it's Ron, it's going to be ten. And fair or unfair, I think it's probably fair. And I'm a huge Ron fan. Love the guy. Love him personally. Um, love his game. But, uh, you know, because of what Ron's been involved with in the past, his past comes with him. It's unfortunate because he's turned himself around in a lot of ways. You know, but his past comes with him. I mean, this is the same guy that two years ago, after after hitting a game-winning shot in a Western Conference Finals game to put his team in the finals, refused to answer any of Craig Sager's questions till Craig Sager said Queensbridge. Okay, mm-hmm. wouldn't answer a question until he said Queensbridge. All right, <laughs> Ronnie is Ronnie marches to his own beat. It's the same guy that when his team won the NBA Finals on national TV. He he thanked his therapist. He's out of his mind. Now you know. The thing is this, it's, you know, it, I look at it as Ronnie, you know, was has been playing the last two weeks some of the best basketball you've seen him play since he was with the Pacers. He's been terrific. And I think that excitement got to him a little bit. Um, but it's interesting because you, a lot of people, you know, there's been huge Twitter debates about intent and, you know, the look in his eye and you had a lot of the Laker apologists, you know, uh, Harden deserved it. I don't ever think you can measure intent on a guy. I think it's a, it's very hard from looking at something and even breaking it down in slow motion, which I think makes it harder. Talk a little little bit about this whole what he intended, what he didn't intend. I mean, can, you know, ta, 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 uh, do, do you think you can measure intent in a situation like this? No, and that's why I think I kind of generally sort of try and put it in these terms and, and say that he lost his brain there for a second and he really didn't know what happened or, or how hard he hit him. Uh, he just, it, it was immeasurable. And he kind of said, you know, oh, I, I've i have sort of gone through that before. Marcus Soule hit me once and I was spitting up blood. Um, but he also said post-game, uh, you know, I, it, it looked bad and, and I hope he's okay. But he he doesn't know how hard he hit him. He didn't know what he was doing. And, and, and intent, 
I mean, yeah, it's it's impossible really to judge. Uh, fact is, um, he threw an elbow as, as hard as he possibly could. He had no idea. The fact that he had no idea who was there, um, where he was exactly, uh, and what he was doing means he, you can't really judge the intent because he's just kind of threw that bow irrationally, not knowing what was happening. I wish it was a seven footer that you know happened to bump into him, so he could have taken it on the shoulder rather than the neck slash ear. Uh, and it would have been a whole different scenario. But, uh, again, you know, James Harden was, is entirely innocent. He was going back on the play. If you didn't want to play, if he wasn't a, a guy who played defense, it would have been better enough because he wouldn't have been by the rim there. But he just happened to bump, in, bump into him because he was going back towards the basketball. But uh, Ron, again, had no idea what was going on, and, and his brain just, just kind of shut off there for a second. He just got into, I don't even know what you want to call it, beast mode, hero mode, Tarzan mode, <laughs> where uh, – he just he just lost control and uh, and he he still doesn't know how, how hard he hit him so you can't measure intent in that situation. I think it was more so of a perfect storm. You know, you kind of pointed out there, Taz, with you know saying if it was a center, it wouldn't happen. You know, if it wasn't James Harden, it wouldn't happen. And I think you know you look at all the characters involved, and you got one guy who has a bad reputation, one guy who has you know so far a flawless you know reputation in James Harden. Everyone loves him. He's a lovable guy with the best beard in the league, and you know he doesn't say anything bad about anybody, and he just plays the game the right way. And a lot of people love James Harden. So you know if it was you know another player, most people don't like. I don't think it'd be this big of a you know situation but to get away from the art test elbow i got a little more lighthearted question for you and uh you know you guys posted up that steven jackson went to sea world and uh everyone knows about the dallas mavericks taking a little trip to the zoo so my question for you taz if you could take any current nba player with you to the san diego zoo this weekend who would be with you and why well i've never been to the san diego zoo myself so i don't know what i'm getting myself into um not a big fan of zoos. I say, I say let the animals run free in their natural environments. But um, if I was to, uh, if, I, if I had to go, I mean, I want somebody who probably would feed the animals just to liven it up a little bit. Um, and, and who would be that guy? Probably not Chris Kamen. He'd probably bring a gun to the zoo. Uh, not a good idea. Um, hmm. Um, somebody, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, somebody who's had a lot of pets as a kid, maybe somebody who grew up on a farm, that's probably Mickey not Moore? a bad idea. <laughs> Mikey Moore. <laughs> uh, He's got a lot of snakes. Is there, oh, that's that's actually a good call, the snake, snake route. Uh, is there a guy who grew up on a farm that I'm not thinking of? I mean, Chris Kamen maybe grew up on a farm. Brad Miller, I guess, is uh, is a pretty good one. I mean, he knows he knows his animals very well, although I believe he does shoot them on his uh, his reality show, whatever show he's got that that Trey Kirby, our blogger, really likes. But uh, I don't know. I think Brad would be a good idea. He'd probably get dressed up in camouflage so we can uh, kind of hide away from all these animals. But uh, that's that's who I guess. Interesting. Now it's funny because I, I, if I was going to the zoo with somebody, I'd take it away from the NBA. It'd be Mike Tyson, just because I'd want to see him interact face to face with some of those tigers. Because I got a feeling some of the tigers would be running in fear. <laughs> All right, now Taz, give us this, okay? You got to have dinner with three NBA people. Could be players, could be coaches, could be journalists, ex coaches, announcers. Give me your table of four, you and what three. Well, I am a, a Hubie Brown enthusiast. I love Hubie uh, and everything he does and everything he says. Uh, he's incredible. Um, and I, I wish he was the color commentator on every single playoff game. So I'm taking Hubie, number one. Number two, um, maybe somebody like Pat Riley. Uh, a lot of a lot of stories in that man. Uh, I want to see the cocky swagger and the slick hair in person. Uh, I think he... Uh, you bring a lot to the table there. And uh, a third, uh, that's another tough one. Uh, maybe Mark Gasol, because he's, uh, he's a very nice man. The nicest, probably the nicest NBA player I've ever met. That was probably that was a downgrade from the first two, but uh, they can't all be winners, so I'm bringing Mark Gasol. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's got to be nice to the waiter, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, so... Um... Republican Governor Christie had some kind words to say about the New Jersey Nets. You know, he said, you know, if you don't want us, then leave. Get out of here. Not the best approach if you're trying to keep a sports franchise. And we see, you know, how important some franchises are to cities. And, you know, we saw the Seattle heartbreak when the Sonics left and became the Thunder. If you are the owner of the Nets, pick any owner. You can be Jay-Z. You can be Mikel. I don't care which one. 
what would your rebuttal be to Governor Christie? I mean, Governor Christie basically said, like, get the hell out of here. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yes. something along those lines. <laughs> what he said was this. He, somebody asked him who was going to the net game uh, last night. And his answer was, I have one message to send to the Nets, goodbye. And he essentially said, good riddance, if you don't want to be here, we don't want you here. We gave you a state-of-the-art arena, um, a great city to play in with great fans. Uh, and he's, I think he's right about all of it, by the way. Um, and, you know, if, we, if it's not going to be you, we are confident in our ability to attract another NBA team. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't agree with a lot of the things you said there. I mean, it, it seems like uh, no one particularly cares that they're leaving. I mean, uh, maybe it's because this has been happening for a long time, but in, in comparison to other franchises which have left, it feels like the, the uproar is absolutely zero in the, the New Jersey, New York area. And from what I know, from what I know the uh, situation and where they play um, isn't ideal whatsoever. But at the same time, uh, you know, I felt a little odd watching the game yesterday and, and Kenny Anderson in the house and, and Jay Z in the house. Uh, basically, if you know, it, it is a goodbye. It, it's it's not a happy ending whatsoever. And to see those guys there, just it, it didn't really make sense to me. You know, obviously they are there for whatever PR reasons, uh, but at the same time, it just felt like. I don't know. I mean, they are turning their backs on on the city and and going to a more optimal situation for them. Uh, so, as as far as the governor goes, I I kind of I kind of understand where he's coming from. At the same time, I mean, it wasn't an ideal situation for the Nets, uh, for the team, the fans, for any of the players. And Mikhail Prokhorov, I think, is is doing. Uh, as best he can with the roster. I really think he, you know, he did make some mistakes and, and, and giving away a, a first round, possibly like a number four pick for Gerald Wallace, definitely a mistake. You know, he tried to, to pry away Darren Williams and, uh, you know, keep him there and, and make as many moves as possible for him. So uh, I, I, I do really enjoy uh, Prokhorov and obviously the personality he brings to the NBA and, and the effort that he brings. Uh, so I'm interested to see what New Jersey does in Brooklyn, but at the same time, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm obviously not from the New, Jer- New Jersey area and, and nowhere close to it, but at the same time, it doesn't feel like anyone particularly cares the way other franchises have when they lost the team. Well, there's a couple reasons for that. Now, understand something, but before I proceed with what I'm going to say, this is my backyard. Okay. Okay. Right now, as I sit here and talk to you, I am looking at the hotel that teams stay at when they come to the Prudential Center to play the Nets in Short Hills, New Jersey. So this is my backyard. Okay, people cared. Okay, they're not freaking out because essentially the nets are moving 20 miles away. It's over two bridges and through tons of traffic in Manhattan. Okay, (laughs) but they're moving 20 miles away. If you want to live with the hassle, you can go see your team. So that's why you're not getting Seattle level outrage over the Nets leaving. Um, I think with the point that Christie was trying to make, and it's not a bad point because I spend plenty of time in the Prudential Center, although I'm not a Nets fan, um, is the Nets did a very good job of rubbing Brooklyn in the Jersey fans' noses, and they're good fans. You know, they come to the games. Attendance there is, is not, it's not wonderful, but the team stinks, and it's not awful. And they've kind of lifted their leg and peed on the Jersey fans a little bit, you know? And it's interesting, because Prokhorov bought the team. If they weren't moving to Brooklyn, he never would have bought the team. Bruce Ratner originally put this plan together, and essentially he bought the team as a a conduit to a land grab in Brooklyn. And then he ran out of money and needed Prokhorov's money. Um, one of the reasons it didn't work for the Nets in Newark, and it, it was always going to be a short-term stopover for Brooklyn, one of the reasons it didn't work for the Nets is because they're a tenant in the building. And in the particular model that sports franchises have right now, unless they're a partner in the revenue that the building's making, being a tenant is not a profitable type of arrangement, which is why they're not going to be a tenant in the Barclays Center. Um you know, you mentioned before, Taz, about you know you kind of you're a fan of Prokhorov, and I agree. Prokhorov, I want to like Prokhorov is great for the league, um, but it's interesting because Billy King's making all these moves, and you talk about that trade, and I want to get a little more of, of an opinion from you on that trade because, in reference to that trade, um, that's the type of trade that Billy King makes because if he doesn't keep Darren Williams here. He's gone also, and I've heard rumblings about that because it's, you know, you, you, your chips are in the middle of the table. If you can't 
get a Dwight Howard trade done between the draft and July 1st or right after July 1st, um, Williams is leaving. Williams is not staying there. You were right when you said before, Williams is miserable there. He he really, he dogged it a lot of nights this year. He couldn't, I was in that locker room. This was just, this guy had walked around with a pout and what I call TPS syndrome. TPS syndrome stands for, this place sucks. Okay? And that was his attitude from the beginning. Talk a little bit about what you see here future-wise with the Nets, and, you know, you have some perspective on Dwight Howard with, with Orlando, and, and do you think that that's, Orlando's going to want pieces from the Nets for Dwight Howard? Do you think that's something that, that's on the radar screen there? Uh, that's a hell of a question. I think first with Darren, I think we're going to see one of the best point guards in the league uh, get that label again next year. And, you know, we talked about him last year as possibly the best point guard one, two with Derek Rose for a lot of the time while, the, while Chris Paul is out and Rajon Rondo is in that conversation. And Darren Williams has shown it. You know, he got to hit that double nickel this year against the Warriors that one time. Uh, and he'll get back there because he shows it on some nights. And, and I feel like he's probably out. And as you mentioned, yeah, between the draft and July 1st, can they pull Dwight Howard? Oh, man, I, I really don't see how it happens. I, you know, Brooke... Brooke has got to be the main piece, I suppose. I mean, they don't have draft picks yep. anymore. Uh, that they could they could have involved that number four draft pick, and and uh, I guess Billy King wasn't thinking long term in in this scenario. He was thinking short term and for his just to save his job in this situation. But you got to have a little bit of a bigger picture here. You know, you got to go yep. to Mikhail Prokhorov who approves these deals, um, and and say, you know, Darren doesn't look like he's staying here. Are we gonna gonna push for a guy? You know, at about thirty years of age. Uh, who should be your fourth best player when automatically next year Joe Wallace is probably their best player because Brooke is going to be constantly injured as he is. Uh, whatever he is, it's not a playoff team the way it's structured right now. Uh, I don't see the parts for 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 uh, for Dwight, and, and I'm not sure uh, in the first place if it was going to happen. Um, you know, Dwight seemed to prefer uh, Dallas slash, uh, what was it, Lakers, the Lakers situation. But at the same time, he wants to get out of there. So, I mean, he's desperate, and, and Brooklyn is in a bad scenario. So, you know, on the other hand, he's got to go somewhere. He needs to – it might be a nice little perfect storm right there. Boyd's got to leave before the next season begins uh, for the Orlando Magic. And, and maybe it does work out. I mean, can Billy King influence uh, Otis Smith? I, I don't think he's got the draft picks to pull it off, though, unfortunately, anymore. You're looking at a package of possibly Brooke, Marshawn Brooks, and uh, – I don't know. I mean, any anything else you can throw at him for Dwight, and uh, I, I would think that the Orlando Magic can pull off something better than that. Yeah, I would agree so too. But I know you're you got to run a, in a second here, so I just want to apologize that I could not play Gangsta's Paradise. Weird Al Yankovic gave me a call. He said, "Don't do it. The legal battle is not worth it." So I just wanted to tell you that that I couldn't play the Gangsta's Paradise as you came on to the show today. Highly disappointing. Very disappointing. <laughs> hey, have, uh, you haven't be, you haven't dealt with his lawyers, have you? <laughs> oh, come on! This is the internet. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> uh, Taj, you've been fantastic. Can't thank you enough for giving us twenty, thirty minutes of your time today. Je- gents, thanks very much. Anytime, and uh, enjoy the playoffs. Uh, you too, Taj. Thanks so much, Bub. We'll get you back again soon. Bye now. Everybody. Bye-bye. Everybody, that was Taz Malaz from the Pro Bas- uh, sorry, the Basketball Jones, and his Twitter is T A S M E L A S, and he's fantastic. So, we got a little fun talk out of the way. Now we're going to get really serious with uh, Zach Harper from True Hoop in a couple minutes as we wait for him to hop on here. So, uh, you got anything to say, Brian, before we wait? No, it was fun. Taz is great. You know, he got me talking about getting my nipples milked. I, no one ever does that. So. <laughs> But a lot yeah, of fun, the, and he's got interesting perspective on the magic and Dwight Howard. You know, I, I this, think he's this, right uh, on board with the rest of us. This episode is actually going to be a little bipolar episode here. We got you know jokes and comedy in the first half, and the second half we're going to get into debating what we think is going to happen the rest of the way. And now joining us is Zach Harper from True Hoop. How are you doing today, Zach? I'm excellent. How are you? We're fantastic over here. We just had a nice laugh with Taz from the Basketball Jones. It was good times, and now we're going to you know, rack your brain on what you see happening in the playoffs. So you're here with Brian Gelseller and Jacob Noble. Thanks for having me. I, I once had a really awkward uh, hug with Taz in a, in a New York bar. It was uh, all my fault, and I, I still feel bad about it. 
there. <laughs> That's good stuff, Zach. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you told us about that because next time we have Mom, we want to get his take on that awkward hug. Maybe he takes the blame for it, but next time you guys got to execute a little better. Oh, I, re- I re- hope he just forgot it entirely. <laughs> So, Zach, we got a big one tonight, Phoenix, Utah. Interesting matchup in the respect that, uh, you know, Phoenix runs pick and roll. They do it very well. They're going to run pick and roll at a guy who is a player I really like a lot, Al Jefferson, but his one weakness is pick and roll defense. Um, give me a little bit of an idea of what you see happening tonight, and ultimately if you believe that tonight's winner is going to get that eight seed. Uh, I think the winner tonight um, will get the eight seed. Uh I know the Suns play the Spurs um, for their final game, and I would expect the Spurs to pretty much rest anybody they can. That doesn't mean they won't still have a chance to win because we've seen that. But, uh, you know, I think the Suns can take that last game if they've got a playoff berth on the line. And Utah wins tonight, and, they're you know, they're in. Um, I I think you pegged it perfectly. It's, it's pick-and-roll defense. It's can the, can the Jazz bigs. Out muscle the Suns bigs and make it you know make it a factor. Can they defend the pick and roll well enough, and uh, can they rotate you know decently defensively to where you're not getting up a lot of open shots? Uh, if the Jazz do that, it's it's over. They're in the playoffs. Now my my question is not going to be the best question in the world, and I'm not too proud of it, but it's it's a follow up to what we were just <laughs> talking about here. And do you see the eighth seed, whoever that be? You know, it sounds like you you think the Jazz end up going to lock up this the spot tonight. Do you think that they can win a single game in the first round? Oh, absolutely. I think um, as, as far as winning one game, uh, the Jazz are very good. I know you're basically relying on Devin Harris in the playoffs, and Devin Harris this year has not been very good. No. Uh, but I, I like I like their, I like their depth with the young guys. I think they can get scrappy, and they can get a lot of energy at home. I think they could easily steal a home game. Um, switching to the East for a minute. Because, you know, I've been a Heat guy from the very beginning of the season, and I don't waver often, and I still haven't wavered, and I still think they're going to win the East and win the title. But it's funny because as time goes on, the team that I look at as the biggest threat to them is not the Bulls. And I know people think that's nuts. A lot of people believe that the Bulls, which is generally the same cast of characters year over year, have a better chance against the Heat this year. I don't believe that. The team, if I'm the Heat, that I'm really worried about beating is the Indiana Pacers. Talk a little bit about the Pacers and, and what you see as being their chances t- to legitimately maybe come out of the East to make the finals. Uh, I would like to agree with you, but um, as long as Darren Collison is, is the heavy rotation guy at the point position, I just don't see it. Like I don't think he's very good. He's a, he's a decent NBA point guard, but I don't think he's good enough to really give direction. Uh, Danny Granger would have to be like 2008 Danny Granger all over again. They'd have to be really hot from three. Um, Hibbert can't fall down as much as he usually does. Right. They're going to need huge. They're going to need huge, you know, play every night from the bigs. Um, I think their defense is good enough. I'm not sold on the offense, and you know, the, you just you need some firepower against the Heat if you're going to win mainly on the offensive boards, which the Pacers can do, and three point shooting, which I'm not. I'm just not That's sure that Danny Granger's going to. Yeah, Danny Granger. If he's been hot the second half of the year. or – statistically trending upward, however you want to, if you believe in the hot hand or not. But, uh, you know, I just don't trust him. He hasn't been that good the last couple of years. You think George Hill being added, you know, he's been starting Hill lately, and I think Vogel's going to continue that into into the playoffs. You think that is something that, that's certainly going to help a little bit because Hill's a better shooter than Carlson, significantly better shooter than Carlson, although he doesn't have the quickness or doesn't really defend as well as Carlson. You think that's a help or no? No, I do. I, I think if you can get – 32, 35 minutes out of Hill every night um, of confident point guard play, good scoring, and decent defense. That's a huge help. I'm a big George Hill guy. I, I definitely like him a lot more than Darren Collison. Uh, he's just one of those guys that um, he's so relentless offensively that even if he's not a pure point guard and he's not a great uh, guy at running a pick and roll in terms of, of passing, he's typically a very good scorer out of the pick and roll. And, you know, that's a problem for – uh, for someone like the Heat, you know, I think Bosch is an underrated defender. Joel Anthony's a good defender. Haslam's a good defender. But can they, you know, hedge hard on that screen and uh, and really cut off any scoring angle he has? That's a tough matchup. 
Now, you, you kind of answered this question a little bit, but I was debating with Matt Moore and Zach Lowe on Twitter the other day about what is, what's going to take to win in this year's playoffs. You know, this is an unconventional year. You know, nobody's really used to it. We're going to have back-to-backs in the playoffs for the first time in God knows how long. And we were kind of going back on, you know, what side of the ball is more important. And I, I took the side that I think that the defensive end is a little more important. I think the teams that play solid defense, and, you know, if you look at the, the top teams, you got, you know, the Spurs, the Celtics, the Heat, and the Bulls. Um, you know, to a lesser extent, even the Lakers are up there, in my opinion. I, I really like their size. And I, I'm on the side that, you know, those are the kind of teams that are going to do well in the postseason, not the, you know, offensive teams, you know, the – so I just want to take your take, and I think you answered it when you said that, you know, you need the firepower to beat the Miami Heat. So talk to me a little bit about what you think is more important this postseason, to have a better offense or a better defense. I'm actually kind of going to avoid the question altogether. I'm just going to say rebounding. I think that's how you beat the Heat is with three-point shooting and offensive rebounding. And when you grab offensive rebounds, you know, you send the defense into a scramble where they're going to try to suck in on the, on the, on the, on the paint to where, you know, they can cut off a quick score – and that leaves guys open on the perimeter. I think that, you know, a team like the Bulls, they're one of the best offensive rebounding, if not the best offensive rebounding teams in the league, and that's why I think they can beat Miami. They don't necessarily have, you know, that guy that can take the 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 pressure off of Derrick Rose to score. Um, you know, Dang's a nice scorer. Boozer should be a nice scorer in theory. Uh, but they don't have that guy. But they have offensive rebounding and they have shooters. And um, if you can – if you can just hammer the boards, I mean, same reason I like the Lakers as you do is I love their size. They can control the boards. I think they have a great shot against OKC because they can control the boards. And uh, I think you control the rebound and, and uh, you give yourself a great chance to win throughout the playoffs. Now, you bring up OKC, which is, you know, a very talented basketball team, a very young basketball team. And when you look up and down the West, everybody's got warts. No one is, you're not looking at one team and being like, oh, my God, this is head and shoulders of the favorite without a weakness. Everybody's got a weakness. My issue with OKC is this, and I had picked them to come out of the West. I'm still picking them to come out of the West, but not as much conviction as I once had. And here's my issue, and I want to hear what your thought is on this. Um I feel like they have an issue with easy baskets and scoring inside. That, yes, they, they Westbrook off the dribble is a very big threat for them, and Durant does play off the dribble sometimes. But they get in big spots and big possessions, and everything's from the perimeter. And to me, if you need to to get a big basket in the playoffs, you've got to be able to do something close to the rim, and you're going to need to get some easy baskets throughout a game. I think they struggle a little bit in that, and, and, and certainly in crunch time. Talk a little bit about that particular weakness for OKC, and if you see that being something that could hold them back a lot. I agree. I, agree. I, I think they're, um, you know, I'm not impressed with their bigs. Everyone loves Serge Ibaka. He's not a good defender. I mean, I mean, he's a good defender, but he's not like some all-world changing defender. I mean, he's a he great shot ball. blocker. Yep. Yeah, he, he he's a great shot blocker from the weak side. He's long enough to challenge you on a shot, but he bites on almost every pump fake. I mean, yep. I, the perfect storm would be seeing him go against Al Jefferson because Al Jefferson never stops pump faking, and he only goes for pump fake. So um, I think that, you know, they can't get a lot of offensive rebounds and easy buckets. They can't uh, get a, a quick score out of the post. They dump the ball into Perkins four or five times a game, and it's a wasted possession four or five times a game. I, I just think that um, – I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if it's it's Collison playing more because he can, you know, he's got good control around the basket. He can get a couple of easy buckets here and there uh, off re- offensive rebounds. Or if it's just spread the floor and hope Russ gets into the paint every time or hope Harden gets into the paint off a of pick and roll. But I agree. Their, their ability to get easy buckets and to avoid giving up easy buckets, they're a terrible transition defensive team. Um, they I'm give glad up you so much on the fast break. And I, I think that's a huge problem. I'm glad you, you mentioned that about Sergio Ibaka because I think if there was no Kendrick Perkins, I think a lot of the points that you just pointed out w- w- would be highlighted and everyone would see that he is kind of flawed as a defensive player. You know, he gets the, the six or seven blocks a game because Kendrick Perkins is doing most of the dirty work and, you know, Sergio kind of gets to roam around. And I, I think it's a fantastic point you put out there. Now, staying in the West here and – if you've been listening to our show, you know, Brian and I are very big on one team and one team only out west. Well, Brian likes the Nuggets, too, but the one team we, we both are salivating at is the Memphis Grizzlies. You know, they, they quote-unquote, overachieved last year. They were battled with injuries, as every team has this year, and they seem poised to make a really, really good playoff run. And watching the two L.A. teams kind of shuffle to not play Memphis and, and get the lesser <laughs> opponent in Denver, what do you see happening there? And 
you know, with the final seeding, do you see the Clippers overtaking the Lakers to get an easier first round opponent? And do you see either of those teams being able to beat the Memphis Grizzlies? Um, I think the Lakers will hold on to the three seed and and I think the Lakers could beat Memphis. I don't think the Clippers have a chance. Uh Chris Paul is fantastic and I think he'll get numbers and he'll get scores, but they I mean how do they stop anybody on defense? Um I you know, I'm one of the one I feel like one of the few bloggers in the in the blogosphere that isn't sold on Memphis actually being capable of making it to the finals for the simple fact that um, they don't shoot well from the outside. Uh, Mayo and Conley are basically their two best three-point shooters, and these guys are under 40% on the season, I believe. And Conley, I think, is closer to 35% than than 38%. And, uh, you know, I I think that outside shooting, you can pack the paint in against them, and um, and they've got some really great – players in the paint, if Zebo is, is completely healthy and what we saw last year in the playoffs, they're a huge problem. And I love Rudy Gay as a as an end-of-game scorer. But, um, you know, what happens if you just leave that uh, that perimeter open and, and dare Tony Allen to make shots or dare Mike Conley to make three-point shots? Um, that just seems like a problem to me. Uh, and it could be. You know, I, I one of the reasons I love them so much is because I look at some of the elements that they bring. They've got, they have good bigs that play. Together. The rip protection is good. Um, their wing defense is excellent. You know, Tony Allen, yeah. to me, is the best wing defender in the league. Um, and I, I think Mayo's a very underrated wing defender. I really do. I think Mayo does a really good job defensively. Um, you make a great point about them with three-point shooting. But, again, I look at it, everybody's got warts. Like you brought up the Clippers. Oh, for sure. they, you know, they have no wing defense, the Clippers. I, you know, they have nobody that can guard a wing player, which to me in a playoff series in the West is absolutely fatal because you got, you know, Kobe, Kevin Durant, Rudy Gay, you guys you got to shut down. And, and, and you have nobody to guard them. The, but it's funny because we talk about Memphis. We talk about the Clippers. A lot of people bring up the Lakers, and I ask you a question about OKC. The one team that's not sexy to talk about, yet just keeps doing their job, and this year's as deep as I've ever seen them, is the Spurs. And it seems to me that the Spurs have a lot going for them right now and really have put it all together at the right time with rest and health. Here's my one issue with the Spurs, and I'm, I, I'm very curious to hear your opinion on this. And was Greg Popovich is my coach of the year, so I don't ever want to come off of him criticizing Greg Popovich because he did the best job of any coach, head and shoulders above anybody else as far as I'm concerned this year. The one issue I look at with them is they've had a very difficult time getting their two bigs, their two best bigs, I should say, Duncan and Tiago Split playing together. It's a combination that doesn't work at all on the offensive end. And, and I think that could hurt him in, in the playoffs to the point that they brought in Barnes and Diaw because he's a better fit with Duncan on the offensive end. How much do you think something like that hurts him where you can't put your two most athletic best bigs on the court at the same time? Oh, it's huge. I mean, I think you're dead on. Uh, Pop is my coach of the year. I, I try to look at coach of the year as, you know, could any other coach do what they did to that, you know, to that level with the same squad, and I, I don't see any other coach, not even like Carlisle or Tibbs, and that's not to say they're not worthy candidates, but, um, but I mean, how does how do you replicate what Pop does for that team in terms of, you know, getting them on the same page and getting them to accept their roles and getting them rest when they need it, sacrificing win streaks that are all about ego. I mean, he's just perfect, and and you know. They've got Dwan Blair and Matt Bonner, who are decent role players. You know, Bonner's a lot better than people think. Um, yep. Blair's probably not as good as people think. He's an atrocious defender, and I don't like awesome. him on offense, but he can rebound. And, um, you know, that's a that's a skill that's very necessary. I, I think they're okay if they don't have those two guys on the floor at the same time with Splitter and Duncan. Um, but the key is when Duncan's not there and Splitter is, does he give you enough offense? Because he has to be a threat. He doesn't have to score, but he has to be a threat to score and to pass out of the double team to where you get that near historic perimeter offense, um, uh, you know, clicking with that second unit. If they can do that, you know, we might we might be looking at them like we looked at the Mavericks last year. I mean, that's a damn good team. 
And don't forget, Pop also has probably the best sense of humor in the league. <laughs> With putting a little did not play because Duncan's old. I still love that. You know, I wake up in the morning and look at that poster on my wall. That's how much I love that one there. But let me jump <laughs> let me jump to the other dinosaur team, and that's the one in the East where I had friends beginning the season tell me this team wouldn't even make the playoffs. Um, they struggled early on. This is the Boston Celtics. I know Brian is not sold on these guys. Um, the news that Ray Allen has bone spurs that you know they need his scoring off the bench is something you pointed out earlier, Zach, that, you know, teams are going to have to be able to score against the Miami Heat and Chicago Bulls if they plan on advancing to the Eastern Conference Finals or the Finals. So talk to me a little bit about your expectations for the Celtics coming into this uh, postseason with the Atlanta Hawks in the first round and going forward. I think they'll beat the Hawks in probably six games. Um, I I like the way, I mean, they have really surprised me. I I thought they'd make the playoffs for sure, but I wasn't sure about um, them being ready once playoff time came and and they've really kind of just progressed slowly throughout the season which is exactly what you want an old team to do and they seem ready now for the playoffs even with Ray Allen's bone spurs um everyone seems to be clicking KG is playing the best he's played in a long time uh Paul Pierce is is seems to get going and you know Rondo's just Rondo's scoring isn't good but he's distributing is such a weapon and he's such a such a pest on defense that if he, the fact that they can they figured out a way to play him and Bradley together um, that's just an annoying back backcourt to go against because yep. those guys are all over the ball handlers, they're all over the passing lanes, they're blocking shots from help, they're blocking shots up on the ball. Um, I like the team a lot, but you know, do you trust Deansma to be the third big man on that team? Do you trust Bass to be the second big man on that team? I, you know, I just don't, and I don't, I don't like Keon Dooling off the bench. I don't like the fact that they have to play. Uh, Quizzy or, or Pavlovich off the bench. Um, there's just not enough. Uh, there's not enough role playing there for me to to look past the big four and, and even Avery Bradley's contribution and think like this is a team that will um, have a legitimate chance to knock off the Heat or even knock off the Bulls if, if Rose is healthy. Now I got an interesting question for you, and it's funny because the two teams that I'm at a contrast here are kind of tied at the hip for an obvious reason. You know, I look at. The Knicks is what will most likely be a seven seed in the East. And I look at Denver, which will most likely be a seven seed in the West. And we know why they're tied at the hip. Um, you know, and I, I look at both of these teams as really pesky first round opponents for different reasons. The Knicks, because they, you know, they're pretty talented for a seven seed, you know, and, and, and Carmelo Anthony lately has been playing like a guy who's clearly one of the, you know, the, Top ten players in the league. He's, he's been a bell cow. He's carried the load for the Knicks. He's been terrific. Woodson's doing a great job with them. They're coming together at the right time here, even though they're not completely healthy. And, and I think they're going to be a bear in the heat. Denver in the West, to me, the one guy, if you're one of these top seeds in the West, that you don't want to have to deal with in a playoff series is Ty Lawson. You know, you're OKC, and now Westbrook, who you want to make sure you have him right offensively. Now you now you have him for at least four games, maybe as many as seven games, having to chase a water bug like Lawson, who's just a really difficult guy to guard because he constantly keeps pressure on the defense. Um, assuming you agree with me as these two teams being really pesky first-round opponents, who do you think is going to be tougher on their opponent, and who do you think might, out of the two of them, if any, have a legit shot to actually pull off an upset? I think if we're talking pulling off an upset, um, Denver has a real chance just because, let's say the Clippers move into that third seed. I think they can. I think they can definitely beat the Clippers. Um, okay. I don't know. That, I don't know if their their size can can deal with uh, the Lakers. I mean, McGee would really have to play out of his mind, and you'd have to yeah. get some good production out of, you know, that trio of Mozgov, Birdman, and, and Kupos, um, you know, a, a good solid 10 to 15 minutes from each of them every night. But as far as being a prob, I'm a huge mellow supporter. I, I know he's a ball hog. I know he's a volume shooter. I know he's inefficient. But there's just something about him at the end of games that scares me and excites me at the same time if I'm the opponent. Uh, you know, if they play you tough, and they and their defense is legit this year. Uh, if Tyson Chandler is not Defensive Player of the Year, I'm going to be really shocked because I'm that with guy you on that. has completely transformed that team. Uh, I mean, they're nearly 10 points per 100 possessions uh, better this year than last year. You can chalk some of that up to to lockout ball with the offense being down, but that's just a guy covering and communicating like like nobody else. Um, you get them to the end of a game 
and I trust Melo to really be a problem. Even if it's LeBron guarding him, no matter who, uh, Melo just finds a way to to be a good enough clutch scorer that uh, – that, that that scares me a lot more than Denver does. I think Denver's road is set up easier for them, but as far as like actually being a legitimate threat um, in terms of basketball X's and O's, I think it, I think I trust the Knicks more to be a bother. I think you hit the nail on the head there, Zach. And and the thing with Melo, in my opinion, is it, it's it's all about desire. If he wants to be the best player in the league, I think he can be. And we we see those nights where, you know, he just makes these shots that are just unbelievable and he just as you said you know he's got this cold blood that runs through him but it, it it's all when he wants it to be and i think now he's got the coach there that he wants uh he, he's on the team he wants he's got the players playing really well around him they're making the playoffs so now the excuses are gone for him and it's time for him to go out to do it so I'll, i'm with you i'm excited to see what he's going to do you know if they end up playing the heat or the bulls whoever it is in the first round i'm very excited to see what they do now i made a comment on uh twitter a couple weeks ago or a week ago rather that you know the the indiana paces versus orlando magic i have the paces sweeping orlando especially without dwight and i got a whole lot of backlash from orlando fans which is expected what is your take on that series? Do you think the Magic can win a game or two or even, you know, take the series from the Pacers? I believe in Stan Van Gundy. I think he's one of the one of the three best coaches we have in the league. Um, I, I believe in his system. I believe that he can figure out a way to get his guys to play for him. And and if they're hitting from three, they're a tough, they're a tough beat. But uh, without Dwight, I – I would be shocked. I would be really disappointed in Indiana if they didn't sweep them. Um, you, you're asking Big Baby and Ryan Anderson to, to man the paint and cover the load, and you're asking Jameer Nelson to be good once again, and it seems like he's only been really good for one year. Uh, and he's he was bad before that, and he's been bad since. And uh, I just think you're asking a lot of that team to, to come through. And I mean, even to win a game, you're asking a lot of them, let alone make the series competitive. You know, we haven't touched on the Lakers at all, and I think it, it's you know it's something that a team you can't ignore because of uh, you know, obviously the championship pedigree, but the you know probably the best combination of bigs in the entire league. Um, I mean, a two part question: Tell me who you think in the West they match up real well against out of the the top. Let's say we'll go top five teams because we're going to clearly draw a line between the five and the six seed between Memphis or whether it's Denver or Dallas. So, in terms of the group of Memphis Clippers, Spurs, and the Thunder, who do you think Lakers match up well against, and who do you think is a nightmare matchup for the Lakers in the playoffs? I think the nightmare matchup is actually the Spurs. Um, I don't. I know that they can dominate the boards, and we saw Bynum grab, you know, thirty rebounds against them. But you look yeah, that was at a little that, deceptive. Uh, I, that was a little deceptive, Zach. Because it, was a, it was a lot of his own putbacks. It was. It was I mean, it, thirty rebounds is thirty rebounds. It's a hell of a game. But um, yes, I think he also shot like thirty percent in that game, uh, which for a center is hard to do. Yep. Um, I think that. Uh, we would see a you know a possible repeat of what happened last year against the Mavericks. I don't I'm not saying the Spurs would sweep them, but um, they don't guard the three well, and uh, the Spurs are the best three point shooting team in the league, and that that's an issue. As far as I mean, I definitely think they would they would beat the Clippers. I don't think that I don't really take the Clippers seriously until they figure know. out. Their defense. Um, I like them against OKC. Uh, you know they've got to figure out the perimeter defense, and we'll see what happens with Ron Artest if that news isn't out already. Um, I you know if he's not there that that's a problem defending the perimeter because I still think he's a very capable defender especially against Durant but uh, you know I I I like him against Memphis I'd probably pick him against Memphis but I wouldn't feel confident about that but it's the way they control the control the paint with Bynum and Powell I do like him against OKC I I really have to talk myself um, into flipping a coin with Game Seven to figure out who I'd take. Now, I'm going to let Brian do the gun to your head question, which is something we've been doing with everybody. So i got one off question for you. It's not related to playoffs, and I can't believe the word playoffs and this team are going to be in the same sentence. But are the Charlotte Bobcats the worst basketball team you have ever seen? And do you think there are college teams out there from last season that could beat them? I, They are the worst team I've ever seen, for sure. Uh, what, I don't know if they're worse all time than 72, 73 Sixers. That's about a decade before my time, but um, – but they're definitely the worst team I've ever seen, worse than those early 90s Mavericks teams. 
uh, worse than some of those Clippers teams and some of those Grizzly teams. Uh, as far as college teams beating them, I just don't see it. I I know there's a lot of talent on, say, let's use Kentucky as an example because that's a hot example. There's a lot of talent on that team, um, a lot of talent that is going to be, an, you know, you can make a lot of all-star teams throughout their careers, but uh, you're asking you're asking young young guys to play against you know grown men who uh, who do you know do this for a living in the fact that they are stronger than probably everybody on the team physically. Uh, there will be a motivating factor, and you know you put any of these guys in college basketball right now on the Bobcats, um, they would dominate. You know, we you saw even what Kemba Walker did. Whether what, no matter what you think about Kemba Walker, um, and whether his road to the to the title was was easy or was inefficient or was lucky or whatever, you know he was really good against college talent last year, and um, I, I don't I don't know why we would just assume that Marcus Teague uh, couldn't defend him. I, I mean, could they defend Gerald Henderson or Corey McGetty or? You know, would Biombo not be as effective in a college atmosphere as Anthony Davis on defense? You know, I just think that you're asking, you know, college kids to beat grown men, and it's maybe one time out of ten it can happen, but I wouldn't pick it. I agree with you. I don't, but that's okay. I'm allowed. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I, I think your whole premise of – a college team versus an NBA team is is extremely solid. But my one big case that I've made, and people have told me I'm out of my mind, which I'm used to by now, um, was is the fact that I think you have a uniquely bad Charlotte team with, yes, a, technically 12 NBA players, but are there really 12 NBA players? Um, and a lot of young guys that they play, okay? And – a Kentucky team that was uniquely good, uniquely talented in terms of the, of the not only the volume of NBA players for a college team, but the quality of the NBA players. I mean, they got three guys on that team. I think are going to be you know very good to great players in the league in Davis, Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, and Terrence Jones. But I think more of Terrence Jones than a lot of people do. But again, my personal opinion. So I figure as long as we're discussing, I would throw it out there. Um, I'll, give, I'll give you I'll give you that that I, I'm also not convinced that Tyrus Thomas is an NBA player. Yeah, I'm not sure either. <laughs> <laughs> He's got an NBA mouth, though, you know? <laughs> um, all right, here's my gun to the head question, Zach. And we have guests every week. Um, and I just, I like to hear it. I like to know. Gun to your head right now. Who are we going to see in the middle of June in the NBA Finals? And who ends up winning the title? Uh, preseason, I picked Bulls, uh, Bulls Lakers. Um, uh, I'm gonna go Bulls Spurs, and the Bulls win in seven. That or they they win in well, yeah. No, I guess they win in seven. They'll win on the road. Uh, that's my horrible prediction. All right. Well, give me give me a little bit of reasoning for your horrible prediction. Um, and the same reason I it's hard to pick against Miami. Um. I really do believe in them. I, I think it's ridiculous that people say they don't have a rotation. They have eight very solid guys, and you know, four of those guys that aren't um, that aren't LeBron, Wade, Bosh, and I'll even throw Chalmers in there. Uh, four of those eight really know how to fill their role, and they do it really well. And I think if you're going to say they don't have a bench, I'm going to say you're not watching the same team I'm watching because their bench guys are not great all-around players, but they know how to play their role. They don't they don't defend the three, and they don't rebound well, and that's two things Chicago does. I thought it would be a factor last year. I mean, Chicago wasn't a good three-point shooting team last year, but I thought the offensive rebounds were going to be a factor. Um, I was right in game one. I was horribly wrong in the four games after that, but I'm going to stick with that philosophy. I think that uh, I think Chicago does well what Miami doesn't defend well. And uh, and that's going to be my uh, my little edge for them. Plus home court advantage. Now I got one more, Jacob. If you if you don't have any more, no, go for it. Okay, here's because it's interesting. You know, you talk, people talk a lot about the concept of momentum from the end of the regular season into the playoffs. And I've always been one, like kind of when the book closes on the regular season, the playoffs are generally a, a, a new day. And you may get a little bit of momentum, but I don't ever think you get a lot of momentum. This year, I think it's even less than what you would get 
based upon this ridiculously compressed season and how teams are, you know, limping into the end of the season just trying to survive the schedule. Talk a little bit about any effects that you see from 66 games in 123 days on the playoffs and, you know, the lockout hangover and the lockout hangover that translating into the playoffs with a little bit more of a compressed playoff schedule. I mean, we're going to be basically playing every other day, right? Um, Yep. That, you know, I think we might get a couple of back-to-backs, but for the most part playing every other day, which is actually a bigger relief than what they were doing in the regular season. But this regular season is so crazy. I, you know, you try to you try to take what you can out of out of what teams do, um, but there's so little rest. I don't really know how we're supposed to accurately judge what has happened. I mean, I I'm yeah. trying to piece it together the best I can, but you're right. It, it's a hectic season, and it's going to be a truncated playoff schedule and. Um, and, you know, maybe this is the year where depth just matters the most. And teams like Chicago, teams like um, the the Spurs and, and Memphis and uh, and maybe even Indiana because they're pretty deep. Um, maybe those teams use that depth the best and find a way to knock off teams like Miami and teams like the Lakers and I don't think the Thunder are that deep. Um, maybe that maybe that's how everything works out, and it's not so much X's and O's as it is how many bodies you have that are capable of playing and and playing big minutes. And uh, you know, I, maybe we know nothing about it. And it's all about depth this year. It's an interesting take there. It, it, it's it certainly is. I, I always look at it as the war of attrition. And I think most years, yes, you obviously want to get from one round to the next playing as little as possible. But actually, this year, the extra games are going to be killer. If you don't put a team away when you have a team there to put away, even if you do get by them, you have a chance to beat them in five, they stretch you to six or seven. Those extra game or two in the next series, I think, can really have an adverse effect. I think you're right. I mean, you look at just Chicago and Miami right off the bat. Um if if Chicago can put away a team in five instead of six, how many that might, that might be three, four extra days that Derrick Rose has to rest and and get healthy. And, and same with yep. Miami, that might be three or four extra days that um, that uh, Dwayne Wade is healthier and, and LeBron doesn't have to have such a, a big load on his shoulders and Bosch can rest. Um, it might just come down to that where you know the the teams that take care of business when they have to. Um, as opposed to when they're supposed to, might be at a disadvantage. You know, I, I don't doubt that the that Miami will beat the Knicks, but if it's in seven games instead of five, how much does that affect them throughout the rest of the playoffs? That could be a huge factor. Absolutely. Jacob, you got anything else for me? No, I I was kind of setting up for the uh, gun to the head question to sign off, but uh, your brain never stops. Yeah, I went a little further. You know what? I got to tell you, Zach was awesome. I was having too much fun to to just walk away on that one. Absolutely, Zach. We would keep you all day and night if we could, and we know you got things to do and you're a busy person. So we'll let you get off here, and uh, can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, anytime, guys, and come check out the uh, Daily Dime Chat on ESPN.com every night in the playoffs. Absolutely, we certainly my favorite will make sure chat. We do that, and Zach, we're getting you back sometime soon, man. This was tremendous. Thanks so much. <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody, Anytime, guys. Thank you. everybody right, you that is Zach care. Harper from True Hoop ESPN. You can follow him on Twitter, Talk Hoops. And after you know, telling everybody these uh, Twitter handles, Brian, I think I need to get an easier one to say on the air because it's not not easy to say and you know taking out vowels and everything. But you know, you live and you learn. Yeah, you'll be able to figure that out. I just well, let's make sure one thing: let's plug Zach's daily dime chat every night of the playoffs. Zach Harper, our guest that we just had, who was outstanding, is going to be doing a chat on ESPN.com's daily dime, where you can just fire questions into the computer, and he's going to answer questions for you live while games are going on. And you just heard what we did with him in the 40 minutes that we had. The guy's great, and uh, it's something when you're watching games in the playoffs. I think it's a great idea to sit down and do that. It'd be a heck of a lot of fun, and, and you got a real good guy in the other end answering your questions absolutely and it's a whole team of them too so you know they have they have other experts pop in and out and it's it's one of my favorite chats to attend you know if i'm sitting at home and watching games and you know no one to tweet at i'll go on there and uh, have some fun and it's always always a good time and a lot of information and a lot of good strong debates it's it's, it's a definitely an intelligent conversation that goes on in those chats absolutely absolutely 
that will do it us for here. Um, we might have a show this Friday. We might not. We'll keep everybody posted. We're still working on that, and and we'll be breaking down the playoffs next Tuesday. Do they do they start next Tuesday or following uh, start Thursday? Saturday. They start we, this Saturday. We get- Yes, we're gonna see. Let's. We're gonna. I'm gonna try to. I'm trying to get us somebody for Friday, so we may have a show Friday. Um, but you know, we playoffs start Saturday, so it all. You know, season ends Thursday. Not a lot of time to rest. One night to rest, and it all kicks in starting Saturday. And I got to tell you, I can't wait. Absolutely. This is this is making me rethink my wheels here, Brian. I might have to find a way to get a Saturday day show before these games start, and you know, you and I can kind of get our our opinions on air and break it down. We'll, we'll talk and, and figure out what will work out, though. Uh, sounds great, my man. Absolutely, and this is a fantastic show. We love this two-guest format. Um, it's been exciting, and we will be back maybe Friday. If not, we'll see you guys on Tuesday. We are NBA Unplugged. That is Brian Geltzeller from the Hoops Critic. I am Jacob Noble from com. We can't thank our guests enough. We had Taz Malaz from the Basketball Jones. It's an awesome Canadian website, which they've basically take, taken over America with comedy and basketball. And then absolutely with uh, Zach Harper from ta- uh, True Hoop ESPN. Go to his Daily di- daily Dime uh, live chats during games. It's awesome stuff. Follow him on Twitter at Talk Hoops. And that will do it for us for here. Everyone, take care. I'm on my head.